Hello. 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 How are you? Welcome to Blue Mind ASMR, your personal relaxation station. I'm your host, Blue Skies. This is going to be a little bit of a different episode because, well, so I recently stumbled over one of my old final projects from my university days. It's from either 2015 or 2016, I can't quite remember, but I was working on my WIGS major, that's Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies abbreviated, and I forget which class this was exactly, it might have been feminist history or something like that. But anyway, my group decided to make a podcast for our final project, Fancy That. So this is not ASMR, but hopefully some of you will find this interesting anyway. Or maybe you'll learn something, or just get a good chuckle out of hearing slightly younger me. (laughs) Uh, Personally, I think the topic I chose is really fascinating. Even, you know, even though it was my final project, I listened back to the whole thing and I'm like, oh, that is, that's, those are some good thoughts right there. I forget so much from, from (laughs) my classes and everything. Time passes, you forget things. (laughs) But yeah, the podcast we created, um is no longer available on most apps, so that's another reason why I wanted to share this here. It's like, so it can exist, it can continue to exist. But anyway, thanks for listening, and here we go. Hello there, this is Blue. Before this podcast starts, I need to take a minute to give a content warning. There's going to be some potentially uncomfortable, potentially triggering content in this podcast, so please listen at your own risk, and please turn it off if you don't like what's happening in this podcast. Thank you. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Oh, that's how you do that. Okay. (laughs) I'm still getting used to this uh, application I'm using (laughs) for recording. So, hello everyone. This is Blue. I'm back. Thank you so much for listening to our podcast, So Yeah Feminism. And this is the episode where I'm going to get into the meat of my research project, and it is going to be really, really interesting. Trust me. (laughs) But first... A special message from our sponsors. That's a joke. We d- we don't have any sponsors. <laughs> this is a uh, this we're students. We don't have any money, and this is a no budget podcast. Just a friendly reminder. <laughs> I'm recording this in my living room. <laughs> okay, that was a little too loud. Sorry about that. It was a little hot. A little hot in the microphone. Okay, that's better. So, I'm just going to get right into it. This podcast is going to be about feminism and consciousness. What is consciousness? You're asking yourself right now. I also ask myself that every day. (laughs) Okay, no, really. I'm going to break it down for you. What am I talking about when I'm saying consciousness? Consciousness is kind of like... An academic term that's thrown around a lot in my field, women, gender, and sexuality studies. So it it can be it it is it's it's not readily obvious what consciousness means. It's not like, hey, I woke up, I achieved consciousness. I mean, yes, you did, but (laughs) that's not what we mean. Well, actually, no, that's a good metaphor. It's kind of it's it is kind it's kind of what I mean by consciousness, like 
It's kind of like waking up. Okay, so let me say how it's like waking up. It's like, if you can think back to a time before you were feminist, or if you're not feminist, like, just roll with it. Um, If you think back to that time, there was, like, something you saw, or something you experienced, or read, or something, and it kind of, like, something happened where you're like, oh my gosh, the world is unfair, or something like that. You realize, like, you had a sort of awakening to injustice or inequality or like how women are treated versus how men are treated or how uh, queer people are treated versus straight people are treated, how they move through the world, stuff like that. Um, There can be class consciousness. Like if you went to school as a kid and realized your clothing was not the same quality as other kids or your food that you had in your lunch was not the same quality as other kids if you were lucky enough to even have, you know, a packed lunch or be able to eat at school. So as you are probably getting the idea, there's a lot of different forms of consciousness that you can achieve. There's like person of color consciousness, woman consciousness, trans consciousness, uh, working class consciousness. There's just there's just like general consciousness Like, you become aware of the systems of power that are active in the world. And I I am getting this definition from just being a a women's studies major. Like, consciousness is talked about a lot, but I will be citing... uh, I'll be citing... (laughs) I'll be giving details on a lot of the sources that I'm getting... I'm pulling this collective definition of consciousness from. I'm going to talk about a lot of different scholarly uh, sources that discuss consciousness. I'm going to be breaking those down and really talking about achieving consciousness. Yeah, achieving consciousness. And that is realizing how you are how you are positioned in terms of power and choice and privilege in relation to everyone else. But not just that, like realizing putting yourself in someone else's shoes and realizing how they are positioned in terms of power, choice, and privilege in relation to everyone else and how everyone is interacting with not just people, but the systems around us, like capitalism, white supremacy, the patriarchy, everything like that. And and institutions too, like government institutions, etc. So yeah, when a person begins to identify as a feminist or womanist or activist or uh, social social justice person, um, whatever they may identify as, this is usually a result of consciousness or like Marxist feminist, like. Or if you identify as a socialist or a communist, these are also things that are a result of consciousness. You could even say, like, whether you identify as Democrat or Republican or Green Party or Independent or whatever, that's also a result of consciousness. Um, Sometimes, hopefully. (laughs) So what I'm saying, what I'm proposing is that identities often result from consciousness and if not identities loyalties like affiliations like i think for me feminist is like being a feminist is like something between an identity and a loyalty um ooh that's interesting <laughs> but uh but yeah so this podcast is i kind of want it to happen in two parts um a historical part and a practical part So part one, we'll be looking at my research to see how consciousness has been achieved in the past and how that consciousness has led to acts of resistance. And that's the historical part. And then I want to move on to something more practical. I want to talk about how we, you and me, (laughs) can help people now, people we know or whatever, achieve consciousness when Honestly, this just feels so necessary in this moment, especially with a certain person, uh, uh, Donald Trump, (laughs) about to be elected as, (laughs) I won't say it, it can't be true, Um, 
And with the bathroom bills, like in North Carolina, and this is just like the tip of the iceberg, like how do we help people achieve a feminist consciousness of any kind? Um, How do we help people realize to see the injustice that we're seeing and and if you're someone listening who feels like they don't have that kind of consciousness yet, how can you achieve consciousness? This is a question that really interests me. So we're going to use the history part to talk about the practical part. How do we, how is consciousness achieved? How can we do that in our everyday lives? So I'm going to start by talking about a book by Catherine A. McKinnon, uh, a well-known feminist, and her book is called Toward a, the- Toward a Feminist Theory of the State. Chapter 5 is actually called Consciousness Raising. So Consciousness Raising is, is basically, this this term means what I've been saying about achieving consciousness, like when you, when you wake up, when you realize um, that there's injustice in the world and your, your relation to, uh, to power and privilege and oppression in the world. So on page 83, uh, McKinnon defines consciousness raising as a feminist method and as the collective critical reconstitution of the meaning of women's social experience as women live through it. Oh my God, what does that mean? <laughs> I swear sometimes I hate academic writing because I have no idea what they mean. And I'm just like, you don't, you don't need to say it like that. You could explain it in such a more obvious way, you know? <laughs> but I'm here, so I'll break it down for you. So consciousness raising means like women get together and basically substitute women for any group of people people who people who are oppressed get together and they talk about their lived experiences and then they're like oh oh my god this lived experience i had represents an injustice in the world like it tells it it discusses an, an injustice an inequality a power imbalance a power relationship in the world so that's what consciousness raising is So there used to be, consciousness raising groups used to be really popular in the U.S., I think, and that's something that McKinnon discusses, okay, yeah, in the 1960s and 70s. That's on page 84. So these groups used to be really popular, and women would go to them and tell their stories, and, you know, in the group they could be like, oh my gosh, this is, you know, this is so unfair. This is something about being a woman that bothers me, and let's talk about it. And now we've raised our consciousness. On page 85, McKinnon says the women in the group, in the groups, would talk about things like virginity crises, relations among women, mothers, body image, and early sexual experiences to orient the discussion. So they also talked about really routine things. On page 88, uh, McKinnon says they talked about walking down the street, talking with bus drivers, and interacting with cocktail waitresses. And this makes total sense to me because really simple experiences can can actually reveal so much about the world. You don't have to get really big to under understand um, injustice, you know? So there's this really cool quote in here, a woman on page 88 again, a woman is writing in her diary that's quoted here. It says she feels paralyzed by the sense that there exists a mesh of relationships between my anger at the children, my sensual life, pacifism, sex, and an interconnectedness, an interconnectedness, which if I could see it, make it valid would give me back myself. Wow. That is that is so cool, I think, because it's like, I think a lot of people who don't have consciousness just detect that there is something wrong, and they don't understand what's wrong. So I think here, McKinnon is trying to show how 
consciousness is like understanding exactly what is wrong and weaving together lots of little parts of life to understand the big picture of what is wrong. Uh, yeah, just broadly what is wrong <laughs> with being oppressed. <laughs> And on page 89, McKinnon says, through this consciousness raising, a minute by minute moving picture is created of women becoming, refusing, and sustaining their condition. I also like that. I think that's really cool. On 89.2, McKinnon talks about the kind of injustices, like overt injustices that were revealed through consciousness raising, like women... Um, talked about pretending to orgasm during sex and talked about violence they experienced, um, fathers who raped them, boyfriends who shot at them, this is a quote, doctors who aborted them when they weren't pregnant or sterilized them accidentally, psychoanalysts who seduced them, uh, mothers who committed suicide, employers who fired them for withholding sexual favors, unemployment offices that refused benefits when they quit, just all this stuff, Ex example after example of little of, of things that come out when, when you get in a group of, of people who are oppressed in a similar way as you and you can start to build this bigger picture of the world and find like this kind of experience happens to more than just you alone and that that is a part of consciousness raising as it's discussed by mckinnon here and this happened with a lot of women back in the 60s and 70s in these consciousness raising groups that were specifically formed so mckinnon has a really a really nice clean definition of consciousness here so on page 90 of her book she says consciousness raising is such an effort taken in this way consciousness means a good deal more than a set of ideas it constitutes a lived knowing of the social reality of being female so I love that definition, a lived knowing of the social reality of being female. And it's you can understand that, too. Like, that's an understandable, relatable definition. I personally think there's a way to have a consciousness listening to the lived experience of others. But I think li lived experience is always the basis. It's it's and this the quotes that I've just read show that lived experience, someone has to be having the lived experience for there to be consciousness, whether you are the person living that or you're the person listening to the person living that lived experience is anchored, is, is the anchor of consciousness, consciousness. And more specifically, there's this raising, this creation of an awareness of the social constructedness of one's circumstances, like we said, the social reality of being female. On page 90, McKinnon quotes someone from one of the groups who said, we didn't get this way by heredity or by accident. We have been molded into these deformed postures, pushed into these service jobs, made to apologize for existing, taught to be unable to do anything requiring any strength at all, like opening doors or bottles. We have been told to be stupid, to be silly. So there's this awareness, too, in consciousness of you become conscious of how everything is constructed and how it doesn't have to be that way. It was made that way. So, okay, I've been wanting to briefly mention the Panopticon, Michel Foucault's Panopticon, and now is the perfect time to do it, because there's not, like, some group of white dudes somewhere, like, ha ha ha, we need to create a culture where women are subordinate, like, they're not in some fancy office around a table like discussing strategies on how to do this. Um, you know, it doesn't work like that. But uh, Michel Foucault's Panopticon help, has always helped me visualize how this culture that oppresses certain people and privileges others exists and how it continues 
to exist. And Michel Foucault's Panopticon is honestly something you can just look up on the internet. It's very easy to find out what this is. But lucky for you, I'm going to summarize it for you. The Panopticon is actually an Italian prison structure. I believe it's originally originally Italian. And it's like, there's a guard tower in the center, and then the prison is in a circle around the guard tower. And it's like huge. And there's however many stories you want there to be. And not just that, but there's windows facing on every prison cell there's a window facing in looking at the guard tower so all the prisoners can see the guard tower but the window that the guard looks out of like doesn't provide a good view of the guard so the prisoners like they see the guard tower but they can't really see if there's a guard in there so they're like oh i better behave you know, in the way that's expected of me, that I've been taught I have to behave. So they're going to behave really nicely, even though all the prisoners could probably revolt and escape the prison pretty easily. Um, but they they are being watched, even, even if the guard leaves. And there's actually no guard in the guard tower. All the prisoners have trouble seeing that. So they're still going to behave as if there's a guard in the tower. And that's basically, that helps explain, like, who who is perpetuating the patriarchy? Who is a, perpetuating the white supremacy and all that? Well, it's everyone and it's no one. It's kind of like the Panopticon and... Also, when there's a group benefiting from something, that group also has a lot of interest in something being perpetuated. So that seems pretty obvious. So it's a combination of those two things. Again, that was Michel Foucault's Panopticon. I really like that. It helps me understand a lot of stuff. Like when you say, fight, fight the man! Like... I mean, technically there is a man, <laughs> if you're like, you are technically fighting a man somewhere, but like when you fight the man, it's like more than that. It's like you're fighting a system, but it's not a system you can see. It's like an invisible system. It's like, it's like the system at work in that panopticon where everyone is kind of self-policing, but you're also being policed, but you're not really being policed. So like there could be no guard in the tower, but you're being policed by the setup of the system itself. I love the Panopticon, in case you didn't know. <laughs> so back to McKinnon. On page 84, she talks about how in the 60s and 70s, um, these consciousness-raising groups were many women's first explicit contact with acknowledged feminism. And that's a quote. And these groups were, you know, they happened in colleges and universities, women's centers, neighborhoods, churches, workplaces, like McKinnon says, they were truly grassroots. And I mean, we all know there was a huge women's movement in the 70s and 80s. And it, it just, it really, like some people call it the second wave. And that's like in the middle of the second wave or whatever. But yeah, I would propose there is a connection between these consciousness-raising groups in the 60s and 70s and the huge outpouring of activism. Like, consciousness relates to resistance. Resistance happens after consciousness. Um, McKinnon doesn't talk about that specifically, but that's why I'm just going to move on to another, another reading, another source for my research. I'm going to talk now about Melissa Harris Perry's book, Sister Citizen. This is a great book, just honestly a great book. And in chapter chapter one, I'm like, oh my gosh, what chapter is this? In chapter one, uh, it's called The Crooked Room, Crooked Room. And Melissa Harris Perry talks about a focus, groups, uh, a focus group that she conducted 
and this is on page 32, of 43 African American women in Chicago, New York, and Oakland. And she asked them to think about black women as a group and list the stereotypes or myths about them that other people may hold. So this is very similar to the consciousness raising group, right? It's a call, Melissa Harris Perry calls it a focus group, but this is it, it's really very a similar idea. And this one is is made up of African American or Black women, so they can talk about the lived experiences they have as Black women. And something I like that Melissa Harris Perry says on page 47 is there is no single universal black female experience. And I think that is so important to realize why sometimes consciousness, I think actually I would say always, just personally, I would say always, consciousness always has to come from a multitude of experiences. It can't just come from one experience, you know, at it, even as like whatever category you're a part of, like if you're a woman, I think it's it's unrealistic to be like, well, I've never experienced anything bad, so therefore nothing bad ever happens to women. It's, that's just like, yeah, that's not. <laughs> but ironically, that's I think that that is what prevents some people from achieving consciousness is they're like, you know, if bad things happen to women, those things would have happened to me by now or something. And when Melissa Harris Perry talks about consciousness in this chapter, she's specifically talking about how black women come to realize they're standing in a crooked room. Like on page 33, she discusses how um, this focus group arrived at the same three stereotypes. This is a quote that many researchers of African-American women's experience also identify. And these are the awful, terrible stereotypes, the Mammy, the Jezebel, and the Sapphire. So these are just a small piece of the crooked room that Melissa Harris Perry says uh, black women have to live in, have to learn to stand in. And I, I think this is a really helpful visual of becoming conscious like you become conscious of all these things and they make up they make up a crooked room a room that is very hard to to stand in to orient yourself in and that hinders you in many areas of your life and harms you in many areas of your life okay so with mckinnon we talked about women's women's consciousness and let's be honest it's probably white women like if we're talking about 60s and 70s um, back then, the feminist movement was more exclusionary toward women of color and black women. It was mostly a lot of uh, white feminists a lot of the time. There, there are definitely exceptions, but I think we can just generally say the feminist movement back then was more exclusionary toward women of color. And then with Melissa Harris Perry's uh, focus groups, we have... Black women specifically. Now I want to talk about a book called Playing with Fire by the Sangatin writers and Richa Nagar. The subtitle of this book is Feminist Thought and Activism Through Seven Lives in India. So it's a story basically analyzing the collective lives of seven women in India who this is largely based on their journals. And this is going to be a different kind of consciousness because it's happening in India in a formerly colonized country. It's happening outside the U.S. So this is a different kind of consciousness than the ones I've previously mentioned. This is a consciousness formed by Indian women. And this really is by what the book is about. It's about the women forming consciousness, consciousness as Indian women different kinds of Indian women and what they do with that consciousness. So here I want to just uplift that we're making the connection again between consciousness and lived experience because this book is largely a product of journals, right? Journaling is about lived experience. Even more to the point of consciousness, this book is kind of a conglomeration of seven women's lived experiences. 
So just as I said earlier, there's no universal woman's experience. This book is really rich, partly because it's seven women. The consciousness comes from these seven women sharing their experiences with each other. So these women share just a variety of experiences from their experiences with men, with getting married, with their mother-in-laws, um, with losing children, what happens when they have female children instead of male children, beatings that they suffered, uh, just just so much stuff they shared. And I really like this little quote on page 61. There is no doubt that the process of collectively writing, sharing, and reflecting on these very ordinary experiences of our everyday lives has given us new eyes to understand several aspects of our society, whether they are the relationships between women and men, or the various reasons behind women's oppression, or even the fissures that exist among castes, classes, and rural urban locations. So this is honestly, this is like the definition of consciousness raising, right? This is, you share all these experiences, and then you, it's given you new eyes. That's, that's the quote here. They, they, these have given them new eyes, and they say ordinary experiences. I mean, I would say some of their experiences, well, maybe they are ordinary. Some of them are very painful. But I think through this book, these women realize that they they weren't alone in having all these experiences. So many women have these experiences. And this book really solidifies for me the connection between this consciousness, the co- consciousness or consciousness raising and activism, because so much of this book is about these women and their and their activism and their resistance, their resistance to, you know, their experiences showed them things about oppression, and then they go out and they they actively resist this oppression, or they don't go out, they do it within their home. There are many examples in the book of resistance in cases where the seven women are involved in resistance work. Um, just one example I want to talk about is on page 92 in a chapter called Cracking Cages, New Skies. And they talk about their work. Um, this is a quote in transforming the tradition of thrashing the Gudia. So this is a festival, an annual festival where it's tradition for, and I'll quote, boys and men proudly appeared with lashes to publicly whip the rag dolls that their sisters made for the ceremony with great love and labor. So basically it's a festival where men and boys are beating a bunch of symbols, a bunch of dolls, which are symbols of women and girls. So this is was obviously a pretty violent festival. So the women in this book undertook it to actually change this festival, which is amazing. They changed it. Um, they created a new slogan, don't beat the Gudia, swing it. Um, so they changed the festival to instead of beating the Gudia, you would swing the Gudia. And this actually worked. The festival changed from beating these dolls to just swinging the dolls, which I think is so cool. And we can see this book is just a plethora of examples of how the journaling and the consciousness results in things like this, results in these women being able to change a festival in a town in a town where they were organizing to fight for the dignity and rights. This is a quote of the most marginalized women and girls. So this is a big part of it, like seeing this this festival, understanding this festival and how it perpetuates violence against women is a part of consciousness. And they talk about the consciousness, the consciousness aspect of this. On page 93, they say, As we immersed ourselves deeper into the struggle around the festival of Gudia, our understanding of issues of sexual violence and abuse became sharper. They found the courage to dismantle the traditions, beliefs, and hollow rituals practiced in our homes. This, this really is the understanding of sexual violence and abuse resulting in dismantling traditions and beliefs and deconstructing them and reconstructing them. And so the festival is now 
So now on the day, of, this is a quote on page 93, on the day of Gudia, a crowd of 5,000 people all lined up wanting to swing the Gudia instead of beat it. So, wow, that is like huge res- aspect of resistance and success in resisting after consciousness. Okay, so what I want to talk about next is an essay by Sharon Harley called When Your Work Is Not Who You Are, The Development of a Working Class Consciousness Among Afro-American Women. And this is this essay is done with a Marxist feminist perspective. I've mentioned Marxist Marxism a couple times up until now. It's something you can Google, but since I'm here and you're listening to me, I will explain it pretty briefly to you. <laughs> a good way to explain it is using the language of Occupy Wall Street. Like there's the 99%, there's the 1%, and you realize that like the 99% are all have like way less money than the 1% and you're like, whoa, there's something messed up with that. That's Marxism. (laughs) I mean, it's way more complicated than that, but that's Marxism in a nutshell. I want to quote something actually from the Wikipedia page of Marxism. It says, class consciousness is actually required before they can, before workers of a certain class or people of a certain class can affect a successful revolution. So that's kind of what I've been saying all along. Or I suppose at the very least, I've been saying consciousness is related to revolution and resistance. And here I want to talk specifically about class consciousness. And this essay is about working class consciousness among Black women during the progressive era in the United States. The definition given in this essay, it's a pretty short essay, like five pages here. I'm quoting from the first page of the essay. The operational definition of working class consciousness as it, as it is applied to black working women during the progressive era, or in this paper, is the expression of shared interests and the articulation of work-related concerns. So that seems pretty on board with the other definitions of consciousness that I've discussed from the other books that I've mentioned. So the essay talks about a lot of the difficulties that Black men and women specifically experienced in the work in the workplace during this time. Like, of course, Black men didn't make as much as white men, but then Black women also didn't make as much as Black men, yet they were still, Black women were still held to this standard of like a woman's proper places in the home. But so many Black women had to, had to work just for their families to live. And this is discussed in the essay. There was like this shame. And it was part of the pathologizing of the Black community, right? That has always happened. Like, like this essay discusses the, the idea that the Black women Black women are not proper mothers, like this myth that they're not, that the families are somehow defective, like the Black families are somehow defective. And that's all wrapped up in this myth, like the fact that Black men and women just don't make as much money. So like, and that's still true today, right? Like so much of the stuff I've discussed from historical sources is 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 still true today. Like there's no, there's no wage equality today, you know? And this essay talks about how in 1890, uh, 23% of married Black women were in the labor force in the United States, where only 3% of married white women. So this like contributed to the idea that Black families were somehow defective because this systematic injustice is making it so that Black women can't be home with their kids as much like because you have to work to survive and you make less you make less money like what are you gonna do it's just it's injustice and this affected black men too because people rather than just saying like oh hey there's wage inequality black men were like seen as not able to take care of their wife and kids like they were not as good of fathers because they were seen like that when actually that's not true. They just wages for black men were less than white men. That's just the way it was and still is. This essay gives a lot of evidence of a working class consciousness 
particularly revealed in correspondence between teachers and other and other working class black women Lo- looking at letters letters that they wrote reveals that they're they very much have working class consciousness and they're talking with other black women who are enhancing their working class consciousness and shaping their working class consciousness and i asked earlier what do you what are you going to do it's injustice well this essay talks a lot about how these black women resisted it talks about how they went on strike the essay goes into detail on how they were not able to really get justice through the trade unions of the time because the trade unions of the time were really catering to white men and honestly the trade unions were pretty racist themselves the system the trade unions exist in this unjust system as well right so a lot of middle class black women the essay says uh made their own kind of versions of trade unions a quote here in 1897 victoria earl matthews along with other prominent black women in new york city formed the white rose industrial association and established the white rose working girls home so these these did not these were not outwardly this proclaiming themselves to be labor unions they as uh, i'll quote here it had reformist character so it was like oh this is a home to help working girls but to be honest and this yeah this essay goes on to say it it, it sh- this home and association shared similar ground with trade unions of the period in it sought to pre- to prevent working women from being exploited by employment agencies and potential employers. So basically black women were like, okay, racist trade unions, we're going to make our own trade union. (laughs) And I highlight this as another form of resistance in addition to just outwardly having strikes. I think one of the most interesting things about this essay is on the last page, I'll quote here, the essay says, most black women and men and oppressed people in general needed less consciousness raising to become part of the vanguard of a labor movement that sought to eradicate injustices against oppressed workers, regardless of color, gender, religion, and ethnic background, end quote. So I like this because this highlights how lived experience, like, Black women experience the intersection of two experiences. Like black women, they experience being a person of color and they experience being a woman. So like it makes total sense to me that black women would need less consciousness raising just because black women have that many more lived experiences to reflect upon and say, oh, these experiences are indicating there's a power imbalance, there's injustice in the world. And this essay really shows how black women have always been natural, like naturally a part of working class movements and revolutions. Um, A quote from the last page of this essay, a history of working in exploitative situations and of dealing with racial oppression made it easier for black women to identify with the demands of labor organizations and with the plight of other oppressed workers, end quote. So simply by being black women, by requiring less consciousness raising these black women, that is why they are just the natural, the natural allies of other people who are in the working class and who are asking for change and who are resisting and inciting revolution. And this, I use this essay to solidify the connection I've been trying to make this whole time between consciousness and revolution. So black women who get conscious more easily are that much closer to revolution and resistance. The last piece piece of evidence I want to use is an essay by Kwaku Gyazi that is the essay is called From God's Bits of Wood to Smoldering Charcoal, Decolonization, Class Struggle, and the Role of Women's Consciousness in Postcolonial Africa. And 
God's God's bits of wood and smoldering charcoal are both novels. Um, Usman Semben is the author of God's bits of wood, and Tiambe Zalesa is the older is the author of Smoldering Charcoal. And this is a quote from the essay, two novels, the two novels which reflect historical conditions over the period from late colonialism to the beginnings of independent post-colonial African states, Um, specifically the state of Senegal. God's Bits of Wood is set in Senegal. And although these are fictional, technically fictional novels, they do describe the African condition and they're written by authors who are living in this African condition of the time, which involves colonialism. And it also involves, once Senegal becomes decolonized, this kind of 99% and 1% problem, where people are starting to be like, whoa, something is really not fair here. And these novels show African these African authors linking consciousness to resistance in the in their novels so both novel novels describe their characters becoming conscious of the injustice of colonialism and then the injustice of the new african bourgeoisie this rising one percent and when they when they interact with these injustices the characters this is a quote assert their true independence by initiating actions that are intended to bring about change. Um, They go on strike and withhold their labor and uh, various, various other actions, not just by like one example is the male rail railroad workers in God's bits of wood and the male bakery workers in smoldering charcoal, but also the the women undertake actions of resistance too and that's the part about women's consciousness and how that uh plays a role here in resistance and so we see here these two african authors really understanding not just consciousness but women's consciousness in relation to these act, acts of resistance against injustice in their specific post-colonial african states One act of resistance is in particular, I'll quote, the oldest among the women, Nia Koro, is the first person in the book to make a choice between African and French cultures. Her determination to speak only Bambara exemplifies both her traditional pride and her anti-colonialist stance. So her refusing to speak French and choosing her African culture is this act of resistance that results from consciousness. There is another part in God's Bits of Wood where the women specifically, quote, are critically aware that they could not wait for the level of consciousness of those who oppress them to be raised. And so the women disregard the admonitions of the strike leaders not to go into the Vatican. And so they then storm the Vatican as an act of resistance, um, actually in solidarity with some of the men. This is even another example of the connection between consciousness and resistance in the novels. And this is very purposeful by the authors. The essay does go into a lot of detail about how before this, this is like happening in the 1960s, and before this time a lot of African writers chose to make their main characters very French, and these novels are shedding that. They're not only not making not making their characters French. They're making their characters resist uh, French culture and resist the rising African bourgeoisie. And I want to go back to that point for a second I made a second ago about, about how the women in the novel knew they couldn't wait for those, the consciousness of those who oppressed them to be raised. That's That's really saying, I love what that's saying. It's like you can't sit around and wait for the people who are oppressing you or who are doing the oppression of someone to be raised. Like you have to resist, resist to either end the oppression and hopefully, hopefully raise the consciousness of the people who are oppressing you um, to help them realize that this is injustice. 
and in this case, the oppressors would be the colonizers slash the new African bourgeoisie or the new African 1%, if you want to make a parallel with uh, the U.S. So this really brings me to the practical part of my podcast. How do we help people achieve consciousness? Or if someone's oppressing you, how do you get them to achieve consciousness or share the same consciousness that you do? Because power structures, I think all power structures depend on our ignorance. Ignorance being the lack of consciousness of the macro workings of oppression and power and the micro workings of oppression and power. So how how do we achieve consciousness? Well, let's look at the historical examples. There were a lot of examples of consciousness raising, like with McKinnon, the consciousness raising groups with Melissa Harris Perry, the focus group with playing with fire. We had the seven Indian women who journaled and who shared their experiences with each other. And in in all these examples, the people involved shared their experiences with each other and formed kind of a collective experience, especially with the Sangatin, uh, the play, the seven Indian women in playing with fire who you could honestly say just the fact that they published this book both in Hindi and in English is an act of resistance in itself. So clearly, when it comes to raising consciousness, there's an aspect of sharing and listening. Like we have to share our own lived experiences. We have to listen to other lived experiences in order to see the constructedness of so much of our lives and the, the way, like, we weren't born to suffer. There are actual power dynamics and systematic injustice in place that is causing suffering. And once we realize that, that is attaining consciousness. And I want to go back to McKinnon, McKinnon's book, Toward a Feminist Theory of State, to talk more about why it's important for there to be, like, in for in a a consciousness raising group sometimes it has to be a women only group or a black women only group or a queer women only group or a trans people only group because mckinnon says on page 86 of when she was in these consciousness raising groups men's temporary concrete absence helped women feel more free of the immediate imperative to compete for male attention and approval to be passive or get intimidated or to support men's version of reality it made speech possible and i say this to to point out that so often we find ourselves in situations where speech isn't possible because the oppressor is there and so i think As a feminist, and based on all this research, I find it really important to support a Black women's only group. And I don't want to intrude on that space unless I'm specifically invited, you know. And even if I were invited, it might honestly just be best for me to listen. Like, take a step back and just listen and do not say anything. And the same for as a genderqueer person. I really value genderqueer spaces because it's just hard to describe all the things that happen when you're a genderqueer person in a room with a bunch of cis people. Like, there are just very subtle things that make speech impossible and articulating your experiences impossible, which we know from looking at all these examples that articulation of lived experience is a part of consciousness raising. And I want to look at resistance itself as a form of consciousness raising directed at others. Like if you want to get someone to raise their consciousness, like like I, uh, the evidence I presented from the essay on God's Bits of Wood and Smoldering Charcoal, how the women knew that they could not wait for the level of consciousness of those who oppressed them to be raised, they went ahead and performed active resistance, such as going on strike and storming the Vatican. Um, I haven't read this novel, so I don't know why they stormed the Vatican, but obviously it's an act of resistance. And obviously when you can't wait for someone else, like the person oppressing you, when you can't wait for the person oppressing you to achieve consciousness and realize the injustice that's going on, obviously, because it's 
if they're oppressing you, this injustice is clearly benefiting them, resisting the people who are being oppressed, their resistance and revolution is a signal to the outside world and to the people oppressing them and to others who may not be conscious yet, but who are also oppressed. Like, hey, there's injustice going on and the resistance is announcing that. And going back to like women's only groups, black women's only groups really quick. I'm definitely not saying that black women and white women and queer women and trans women and shouldn't shouldn't all talk to each other obviously we all need to talk to each other we need solidarity all oppressed people really at the end of the day need to stand together we all need to stand together all people in this world to fight injustice but when you're just starting out raising your consciousness in that moment when you first need to articulate what your experience has been and you need to listen to other people and you just need that space to form consciousness, that, I want to say, is the most important space to have Black women's only, or gender queer only, or women only, disabled people only, consciousness raising groups, working class, consciousness raising groups, you get the general idea. I've been thinking as I'm doing this podcast that social media is like a huge consciousness raising platform, or at least it has the potential for that, especially like Tumblr. Tumblr is really well known for, you know, it's not perfect. (laughs) It's definitely not perfect, but Tumblr is a place where a lot of people's consciousness gets raised, especially young people. And I would say one of the flaws is it's public and you get trolls and you get haters and you get harassment just really hateful people who can get on your page and intrude on your space. And so there's something, you can't have that special black lesbian only consciousness raising group on Tumblr, or at least you can, but it's very hard because you're technically still a public group. You know what I'm saying? I find it interesting to think about how social media is in some ways making it easier for oppressed people to talk to each other and to see each other and listen to each other and share lived experiences. But at the same time, you don't have that same private experience of feeling safe and feeling alone on the, or not alone, but alone together in a group of people like you on the internet. Now, on the other hand, it does make it really easy for you to get your message out. But perhaps that's why it's not you can't really easily raise the consciousness of a troll on the internet because the internet is just not conducive to that it's not as conducive because okay so theoretically let's say you're trying to raise the consciousness of a troll on tumblr either you like actively resist in some way shape or form like perform revolution or resistance or you engage in sharing lived experience And that troll has to be receptive to your lived experience and maybe would share lived experience as well. And, but not just your lived experience, that troll has to have the experience of hearing a collective of lived experiences together in order to start seeing this as we've discussed. It's it's really funny to be talking about like trying to raise the consciousness of a troll. It seems so. (laughs) It seems so hopeless. And I think another problem is just like a lot of in a lot of stuff on the internet with trolls is just like someone shouting back and forth with a troll. That's that's not going to raise anyone's consciousness. It's just not. I think so. After this, after all this research and this podcast, I think. We, if we want to raise people's consciousness, we have to put a lot of attention into spaces, creating a space where consciousness can be raised. And whether that's in real life or on the internet, it needs to happen in both of those places. Uh, we need to create spaces where consciousness can actually be raised. Whew. So I am nearing the end of this podcast. I'm pretty thirsty. <laughs> Um, but I wanted to say, I want to give some recommendations before I leave. True to my word, I want to recommend some stuff for you to look at on the internet. 
that may or may not raise your consciousness. I don't know yet. So I want to uplift my classmates project. They did a blog for their for their final project for our class. And the blog is feminism and sex work dot blogspot dot com. That's feminism and sex work dot blogspot dot com. And that's just spelled out. And honestly, I haven't got to look at it yet, but I know it's awesome if my classmate did it. I'm actually looking at it right now. It looks really cool. And I mean, I'm really interested in sex work. I love sex workers so much. So, so yes, check this out. I also want to recommend Democracy Now! as a news source. I recently got to hear a talk by Amy Goodman, who's like the brilliant mind behind Democracy Now! It's a kind of it's independent global news, and it is so great. I can't even explain how badly we need independent news, let alone independent global news in our world, especially as Americans. I'm an American, so I need independent global news. And I think you do too, just a guess. <laughs> so I highly recommend Democracy Now!, and that website is just democracynow.org. It's .org, yay! That says a lot when a news a news website is .org, right? <laughs> so I'm going to put my social media up here. You may have heard this in episode one, but you can visit our Tumblr page. Um, our Tumblr page is soyeahfeminism.tumblr.com. That's so yeah, feminism.tumblr.com. You can send asks there. I hope to eventually put some transcripts up there. That would I I really hope to do that someday. <laughs> you can also contact me personally on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at GR Blue Ohio. That's the at symbol and then G R B L U E H I O. And that's my Twitter handle. You can see what I tweet or follow me, whatever. You can email your comments. Um, if you don't feel like tweeting or tumbling <laughs> your comments to me and the other people who do this podcast, um, you can email us at soyeahfeminism at gmail.com. Yeah, thank you so much for listening. I, if you're a listener, I want to know your feedback. Please feel free to send anything, really. And I just hope after listening to this, you've gained a little more consciousness. <laughs> Intro and outro music is from freemusicarchive.org. The song is by Hooden Is, and it's called Mood Music. Houdiniz is spelled W-H-O-D-I-N-I-Z. Boop, 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 the end. The end. I don't know if you were able to fall asleep during that, but I... I hope so, or I hope you learned something or got something out of that. I think it's just interesting to go back and think about the person I was during that time. And things were so different, too. So different and yet so similar. It's just interesting. But as you can probably guess, some of the links I mentioned uh, in that in my final project episode no longer function um and some of the emails i mention uh are no longer checked <laughs> um things are no longer updating you know uh the the podcast is defunct so yeah feminism is defunct um but some of the links i mentioned do work and uh including my classmates blog is still there so i will include uh 
some of the links in the show notes just in case you want to check anything out. And yeah, feel free to let me know what you thought. Um, as always, my contact information is in the show notes. And don't worry, I'll be I'll be back to my regular ASMR uh, uploading very soon. Uh, I don't have any more uh, final projects lurking in my in my uh, hard drive storage. <laughs> But thanks for indulging me. And this is Blue Skies signing off. I hope you have a wonderful, 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 relaxing sleep or day or afternoon or evening. I just hope you're able to relax wherever you are and whatever you're doing. Bye-bye.